Um, so uh, my name is Richard Jeffers from RS Group uh, and I'm going to talk about can an industrial IoT ever be plug and play? So first of all, a little bit of introductions. Uh, I'll start off with myself. Um, I'm, uh, I've been with RS Group for about five years now, uh, but my background's always been before that on the customer side of running factories, building factories and maintaining factories, uh, including, as you can probably guess in that photograph, uh, the Newcastle Brownell Brewery in the northeast. Um, and that means that what I've got is a really deep understanding of, of the customer's problems uh, around operations, maintenance and sustainability. Um, and as I said, I'm with RS Group, um, our RS Components, as we were formerly known up until a couple of months ago. And I'm sure you'll all know RS as an industrial distributor uh, and you know, many, many stories that people talk to us about, uh, about their fond memories of the RS catalogue on their shelf uh, when they were a graduate trainee or an apprentice. Uh, and indeed, that is, that is our, still our core business and uh, uh, 8,980 of our employees spend their time uh, in that part of the um, uh, part of the world but but increasingly we're moving into solutions uh, for customers um, uh, to support them not just with our product sales but actually um, much more tangibly inside their operation uh, across all stages of their life cycle with their assets and those solutions fall into four main buckets uh, design solutions where we help them particularly in the electronic space uh, choose the right components um, to, to build out their electronics uh, our procurement solutions to make it easier to um, buy through our websites, uh, in inventory solutions so we can help um, customers optimise and manage their engineering stores, uh, and, and finally my area which is our maintenance solutions. How do we offer tangible support to customers in their maintenance operations and sustainability journeys? So before I talk about um, IoT and can it be plug or play or indeed anything like that, let's start off by just talking about what is IoT? Uh, when you cut through all the technical stuff, what actually are we trying to achieve with the industrial internet of things? And really it's quite simple. We're trying to collect data um, out of machines, collect relevant data out of machines. We're trying to use that data to allow us to make informed decisions. And most importantly of all, we want to use that, um, we want to then take action out of that decision. And you know, if, if people are not taking action on the data, then quite frankly, there was no point collecting that data in the first place. And, and people talk about IoT as if the concept is new. The concept of, of collect, decide and act is new. But, but actually, it's not. It's been around for as long as people have had machines. Uh, I was in a, uh, a heritage factory recently making uh, wooden cotton reel bobbins uh, uh, in the Lake District. Uh, and, that, and that's powered by the original steam engine that was installed in the, uh, in the 19th century. And on that steam engine is a steam governor. Um, and that steam governor collects relevant data, uh, in this case, the rotational speed of the engine. Uh, it then uses centrifugal force to, um, to fly the balls out and to make a decision about when that steam engine is going too fast. And then it releases a pressure valve to, to take action on that data. And I think people get wrapped up in the technology and forget the simplicity of what it is we're actually trying to achieve collect and decide and act. But you know, the technology is fantastic and it does bring and open up way more opportunities for us than just a steam governor. And a lot of us will be exposed to an IoT through the consumer world and through the commercial world, um, where you know, it, it's, a, it's a vertical solution to a problem. A smartwatch connecting by Bluetooth to your phone, using cellular connectivity to get that data into the cloud, an application sitting on your phone to bring you insight into your health or lack of health uh, and, uh, and, and etc. Um, but unfortunately, in an industrial world, it's way more complicated than that because in an industrial world, you've got massively different types of data and different machines you're trying to collect data from. And that means that if you're trying to do this yourself, you need to be exposed to all the complexity that exists inside the IoT solution. You've got to understand the device layer how to collect the data, what data to collect, how to extract the data. You've got to think about communication. You know, am I going to communicate subtly, uh, sorry, wirelessly inside my electrically very noisy environment of a factory? Am I going to use cables? Am I going to use cellular connectivity? Uh, whatever it is, you've got to think about that connectivity challenge. You've then got to think about your data and how to store the data, how to turn your 
unstructured time stream data into something that you can actually do something with and correlate to, to other data, and how to connect your telemetry data with the metadata that's, that it, that, that um, telemetry data is associated with. What applications are you going to use? So how do you want to view the data? How do you want to process it? And then how do you want to manage this going forward to make sure that you don't just deploy a solution and then 10 years later find that there's nobody on site who ever knew how it was built? You've got to think about how all those different layers connect together. And at every stage in the game, you've got to think about security. You've got to think about how do I make sure this is not creating vulnerabilities for um, uh, you know, a, a vulnerabilities and attack vectors for people to come and try and penetrate your systems. And all of that creates huge complexity that is more, much more than you have in a consumer IoT world. You've got to think about how to integrate a traditionally uh, process control or operational technology environment uh, with the IT world. You've got to think about, as I say, security testing and penetration testing. Think about your data structure and your integration. Uh, and all the way through this, think about responsibilities. Who is actually accountable for each layer, each stage in that layer? So way more complexity than you see in a consumer um, IoT world. And this is, that complexity is exacerbated by the different cultures of people who are involved in managing that system. So in the IT world, um, you know, legacy is the opposite of good. Uh, in the IT people want to understand risk, they want to uh, pivot quickly, they want to move patches out there, they want to make sure the technology is bang up to date. But in the operational technology world, the engineering world, the world that I inhabited for most of my life, uh, actually change is the opposite of good. And you want to deploy a solution and then you want to leave it alone. You don't want to take it apart and find out why it's not broken yet. You just want to have it and have it working in 10 years time exactly the same way as it is now. And those two very different cultures and two very different approaches to risk make that um, technology integration much more complicated than just a technology challenge. And I'm going to come back again to security because it's fantastically important security uh, and way more complicated than just in an IT world. And um, organizations will typically go through three six stages of, of their realization um, and maturity in managing uh, operational technology um, security. The first of all will be some sort of awareness of the, of the challenge. And this could come from some external um, position. It might be you know, your sister company being attacked. Uh, it might be a new board member who's raising the challenge of security. It might be a new insurance company who's, who's demanding that you do something about your operational technology security. But something will happen to drive an agenda inside your business about um, uh, operational technology security. And that's normally led by the IT function or the security function. And what they'll do then is think about understanding what's out there. What is the actual as-built state of your uh, process control environment and your operational technology? Uh, they'll start to think about um, you know, what's actually connected to what, what networks exist, um, what devices are there, what endpoints are there, uh, and, and what, if any, security policies exist to manage that. And this starts with um, the, the IT people getting out there and talking to the OT people, the process control engineers in the factories. And that's normally followed by the, oh my goodness me, moment. Um, probably another adjective could be inserted there as well. Where actually you then find that this um, site that you thought was secure by obscurity is actually anything but that. Um, where you've got unmanaged assets connected, uh, you've got default passwords used, or indeed, uh, I was telling a story yesterday to somebody uh, about a factory I went to where uh, written on the side of the filler in Sharpie was the, pass was the, was the admin password for, um, for the filler. Uh, and she actually said, ah, oh, it's way worse than that. In, in my business, when I moved in there, they'd actually printed waterproof metalized labels with all the passwords on so they wouldn't be washed off during the washdown phase. Um, uh, you know, ports on remote systems are open, so there's USB ports over there just so that everybody can insert that really handy USD drive with its really handy virus on it. Um, and, and a real understanding that this system they thought was secure um, has actually got vulnerabilities and attack vectors all the way over it. And that's then followed by a firefighting uh, phase of going, we've really got to do something to secure this environment because we are 
rampantly open to attack vectors. And that will be things like segment network segmentation, uh, endpoint hardening, removing different ports, uh, you know, making sure that those USB ports are no longer um, physically able to be connected to anymore, um, and actually looking at the patch status. And actually that Windows 95 PC that's never been patched, maybe it's not a good idea, uh, and maybe it's really important that we uh, put lots and lots of um, hardening around that to make sure that it really is disconnected from everywhere else um, versus a more modern device where we can put some patches onto it. Once this firefight has moved, actually now businesses are now starting to integrate. So now the operational technology and IT worlds are starting to behave as one team, starting to operate under a common governance framework and starting to build out a common language uh, and thinking about you know, what is the governance, what is the, how are they going to monitor it, um, how are they going to monitor the traffic on the network, understand how things come in place, and, and actually starting to report credibly about the security on their AT network, which then moves you into the, to the final stage of the optimization and working together. And you know, this is, again, another complexity around industrial IoT that's very, very different from the world of commercial IoT. So, okay, I've talked about what IoT is and about the complexity. So, actually, what are your options as a business out there wanting to move into the world of industrial IoT. So the first thing you can do is you can look at the world of commercial consumer IoT and go, how do I replicate that in an in a, um, industrial environment? So how do I turn industrial IoT into consumer IoT? And there's a lot of solutions out there that look at vertically integrated solutions to, to solve one problem. You know, I want to measure vibration, so I'm going to have a dedicated um, vibration accelerometer that I can fit to something that, that connects with the, um, via a phone or via a, um, a, a local network into a dedicated gateway, going to a dedicated crowd platform uh, and give me a you know, solution for that one particular use case. And then when I start to think about my next problem, energy or maybe quality, I then bring in another vertically integrated solution and another solution, um, all of which are standalone solutions, stovepipes of data uh, that actually end up nowhere. But it's okay because I'll worry about integrating those solutions later. And, and the reality, of course, is you just end up with more and more data lakes. Instead of that data being trapped on its own on a device, all you've done is move the problem. And you've moved the problem from being data trapped on the device up to data trapped in the cloud. The next solution you could go for is to go I'm going to build this myself. I'm going to get out there and work with the hyperscale cloud providers, and I'm going to build out my own solution. So you're going to get out there, you're going to start researching, you're going to design a solution, you're going to pull together um, a proposal, you're going to think about costing, you're going to get it signed off, you then go through design reviews, security reviews, you're going to implement it. And, and the reality is, in this case, two years later, you'll still be talking about what you're going to do as opposed to what you have done. Um, and I don't think I've spoken to a single customer in the three years that I've been doing this who has had a successful enterprise-wide solution uh, because it's always stalled and it's always just been, well, maybe next year we'll be able to do it. Or the third option you can do is actually looking for a solution that is modular, where you can start with some small, quite tangible, focused use cases. Um, that you, with a solution that is secure, proven, and has got credibility behind it, uh, that, that offers a range of solutions across a range of different assets. Um, so where you can actually start and go, actually my first problem is about monitoring, condition monitoring on electric motors. And you deploy that, uh, and you start to see benefits from that solution. And as you grow in confidence, and you start to see the savings, and start to see the, uh, the benefit come through, then you start to um, standardize and roll out with a solution that's not a series of point-to-point -point solutions like the consumer IoT world, but actually a series of solutions that do all work together and do all talk together. And in that case, instead of talking months and years, you're going to be talking weeks and months in order to start seeing the benefit from the first solution. But you know, you do still need expertise in all of this. Um, you know, the, the wiser you are as a buyer, uh, the better a solution you're going to get. Uh, and the, the wiser you are at working with trusted partners, the better solution you're going to get. So actually, you, you need to have people who really understand the problem. Because um, the problem isn't, how do I get the data? The problem is the real world problem you're trying to solve, uh, that the data is going to help you solve. Uh, and actually, where you think the problem is, 
might not be actually where the biggest benefit uh, you're going to see is. Uh, I, I have a standard story that I tell about a, a, it was a bakery uh, that we were working with and uh, they, they, they told us they wanted to come and look at condition monitoring on their mixer for the dough. Um, and in order to get there, we had to walk past their, um, their, their tunnel oven, about 30 meters long. Uh, and as we walked past the end of the, the, um, the oven, there's a, a bunch of guys shoveling chocolate brownie mixture into skips. Um, and we, so we walked past this problem about shoveling chocolate brownie mixture into the skip and went to look, look at the um, mixer. And, and we sort of finished the, this and went, are you really sure you care about vibration on the mixer? Do you not think making the brownies and not putting them a skip would be a good idea? He said, oh, yeah, it's a massive problem. We uh, throw away loads of product uh, because we don't have the oven set up properly. It's like, okay, should we stop talking about vibration on the mixer and start talking about operational monitoring on the oven instead? Because that's where the real problem is. People who can help you have that conversation with them um, with IT, you know, that culture of uh, operational technology in IT, those disconnected worlds, actually, quite often, you need someone to help bridge that gap. Uh, and, and we quite often find ourselves being the catalyst that starts a conversation between the, the operational maintenance people uh, and, the, and the, the on-site engineers and the IT people um, and start to bring those two teams together into a uh, single team. You need to understand the complexities of the control environment. You know, in many, many factories, either the, um, the control environment is outsourced to a third party or, or the, the machines were bought years ago and, and you don't understand how to interact with those machines at all. You want a specialist who can do this, who does it, you know, does it for a living. And then finally, you've got to commission all this stuff and make it work and make it talk together. And you want someone who can you know, help you do that and help you get through that fast so you can get to where you want to be, which is seeing the, um, seeing the value. So final slide. Um, you know, it, is, it is a complex space, IAT. Uh, there's lots and lots of variables. Some of those are technical. Uh, some of those are operational. Some of those are cultural. Um, you, know, you can do plug and play solutions. There are solutions out there in the industrial world that allow you to solve single point solutions in a very quick and easy fashion. The, the challenge is they just remain that, a single point solution. So actually, if you look at a modular solution that allows you to, to start small and then grow out, then that allows you to see the benefits and use the benefits from my first implementation to expand out and expand out and expand out. Uh, and you never do an enterprise level site-wide solution. You just do a series of solutions solving real world problems. And you need expertise. You need people who understand the, uh, the problem statements, you need people who understand the technical, uh, and you need people who can do the project management for you and keep the pace going so that you do deliver those benefits, which is actually what it's all about. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, good to talk to you. And if you want to either ask any questions now or, or continue the conversation on our stand just behind us.